himself or someone else. Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus beginning with that scripture. And as they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? So he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him any longer, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip appeared in Azotus, and through traveling and preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. And God, now we thank you for your word. We ask now that you put your words in our mouth to give to your people. Be glorified, be lifted up, be praised today. Our prayer, as always, when we gather, is if there's anybody here lost, God, you'd speak to them today and draw them to salvation. God, may you just hold us up today and preach through us and bless your people. In Christ's name we pray, and amen. You may be seated. May God bless his word this morning. How can we help people understand God's word? Have you ever read some instruction books that you get for your kids' toys? And you open these instruction books, and there's about 80 pages of instructions on these things. You look at them, and you think, ah, I can do this without the instructions, right? You get about halfway through, and you realize, well, no, you needed help. Uh, Legos. I remember I had the original, original, and I still got it at home. It's tucked away in a bag or in a box somewhere in a closet. But I had the original yellow medieval castle set and I followed the instructions to the T putting that thing together then the instructions got lost and somehow another it got taken apart and I, I never could get it back together the internet is wonderful though you can find instructions for old Lego sets online it's amazing okay it's amazing But we need to follow instructions quite often. If you pop the hood of your car up and you're going to do something to it, you probably need to search out the owner's manual and instructions on how to fix whatever problem you may have. We understand the Word of God is our instruction manual for life. If you never read it, you're not going to be instructed in how to live your life. Within God's Word, it gives us warnings. Yes, and we don't like warnings. We don't like the thou shalt not, and don't do this, don't do that, right? We don't like to be told that. The Word of God gives us warnings so that we can protect our lives and protect the lives of those around us as well. But how do we help people understand God's Word? Philip asked this Ethiopian eunuch here, And we'll get into it in a moment. Do you understand what you're reading? Do you understand what you're reading? Now, I want to ask you, when was the last time you went to work, to school, to a restaurant, to the store, or at a park, or whatever, a ball game, or whatever, and you saw somebody reading the Word of God? Did it strike you in that moment if, by chance, you did see somebody doing that? Did it strike you in that moment to ask him, do you understand what you're reading? Most likely not, because if you see somebody reading the Word of God out in public, you think, well, they definitely know who Jesus is, and they wouldn't be reading the Word of God out in public, right? Maybe, maybe not. We find that our lives, your lives, and our world would be so much better if you, me, and everybody else would just simply read the Word of God. We need it. We need to pray for people to have a desire to read the Word of God. Pray for it. God's Word's amazing. When's the last time you read it? When's the last time you opened up the Scripture at home? I don't mean here. I just read to you. Now, now, let me just say this out front so everybody knows. If you asked me to come to your house to read the Word of God, I would do it. I would do it. But you couldn't all ask me at the same time. Do you, do you see? But if you don't have a copy of God's Word at your house, I will get you one. 
I'll make sure you have one. If you ever need me to read something hard in the scriptures, I'm your man. Or as that, that movie Tombstone says, I'm your huckleberry. Remember that one? Some of you, you older folks will know what I'm talking about. You young kids, what are you talking about here? I may not know all the answers, but I'll definitely read it with you. And we'll go to the Lord together and pray over it and see what God has to say. Now notice, we meet Philip. We've met Philip already. He's one of the seven that God set aside, the church set aside to assist the apostles in the ministry of the church. Now the church has been scattered through the persecution after Stephen's death. And Philip's gone off in, in, this, in, the, in, in, in Samaria and preaching the gospel. And he's doing a great work. People being saved, people being healed, all these things taking place. And suddenly God tells Philip, get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And if you look on your map today, that's desert region. It's desert region. Well, I'm doing a great work here. What do you mean I got to leave? Leave, Philip. Go. Go, go, go. Is what he tells Philip. So first off, to help people understand the word of God, we have to go where the Spirit leads us. We got to go where the Spirit leads us. Because if God's telling you to go to somebody about the word of God, he's already working on them. Do you see? Do you understand? Do you comprehend what we're saying today? He's already, God does not put people on your heart by chance. He puts them on there for a purpose. Because he wants to send you, he wants to send you to be a help to them. God had other plans for Philip other than staying in Samaria. And he sent him south on the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. Gaza was, was formerly Philistine-controlled lands. It used to be the arch enemies of the Israelites. Of course, in Samuel's and King Saul and King David's day, now, uh, Rome, of course, was, the, was over the known, most of the known world. Uh, this is still a, uh, a, a not-so-prosperous area of the world. But lo and behold, even though Philip is told, even though Philip is told to go to the desert road and leave what he's been doing behind, a good work behind, Philip obeys and gets up and goes. This is the heart of a believer. If God tells us to move, we are to move. If God tells us to go, we are to go. If God tells us to do, we are to do. Because he's got a purpose in telling us these things. He doesn't just say, well, you know, I think I'll, I'll send Paul here today. Or I'll send uh, Johnny and Carolyn over here today. Or I'll send Chuck and Alice over here today. Or I'll send whoever and whoever here. I'll send them here. He doesn't just, on a whim, he doesn't throw darts at the dartboard. Who am I going to change their life today? Or who am I going to do this today? He's working. He has the master plan. God knows today. And somehow God knows tomorrow. And God wants you to be a part of tomorrow. Do you see? Go where the Spirit leads you. Secondly, when you go where God sends you, as we meet with Philip here, he does. He goes where God sends him. And this, this came around our church uh, probably now going on four, maybe five years ago. And time escapes me any longer. It may, not, it may not have been this long either, but the term just so happened became a term in our church. We've carried it on and we've carried it on and carried it on. It becomes a, a, a catchphrase in our church. Lo and behold, we find in verse 27, so he got up and went. There was an Ethiopian man there, a eunuch, and high official of Candace, king, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. You got to watch those treasurers now. You got to watch them. This guy was evidently a good one. Judas, Jesus' treasurer, was not. One of the twelve, he kept the money bag, remember him? And he stole from it. There's no record of this man stealing anything from his queen. I think he was a pretty honest man. He had come, though, not from some official business. He had not come uh, with some treasury uh, aspect of his job. Notice why he came to Jerusalem. He came to worship. He'd come to worship. 
Now, you can find that. You can kind of dig in and try to figure out how in the world this Ethiopian man knows anything about God. And there's lots to be said about that. Uh, God will draw those to him that he desires to be drawn to him. No matter where they are, where they're from. Somehow, some way, this man had been introduced to who the God in Jerusalem was, the God of Judah was, the God of the Israelites. He had been introduced to him and was drawn to him, and he goes to worship. And possibly of his allowance of money, he had a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Now, you just couldn't go down uh, to the Walmart, the bookstore down the street that day and time, and just say, I, you know, I think I'll buy a Bible today, or I'll buy an Old Testament, I'll buy the book of Genesis today. Those things were hard to come by. He had the entire, it seems, the entire scroll of Isaiah with him. Just so happened he did? No. He had been able to find it and purchase it, get it, and was reading it. He was reading it aloud. When's the last time you read the Word of God aloud in your home? You know. You may not remember when. I mean, well, it's been a long time ago, Paul. Well, I encourage you this week to gather your family together and read the Word of God aloud. You don't have to scream it out. Make sure everybody's phone's turned off. Make sure everybody, everybody leaves their phone somewhere else in the house other than where you're reading the Word of God out. Read it aloud. Pick a... Pick a good passage. Uh, go back and read the book of Deuteronomy. I got a few chuckles out of that. Why do you say that one, Paul? Uh, you'll, be, you'll come back and throw eggs at me next Sunday, right? But Jesus quoted that book three times against Satan when he was tempted by Satan. Go read the Gospel of John and read it aloud. Philip goes down the desert road. Here comes the Ethiopian. Just so happened, here comes this Ethiopian eunuch down the street. The spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. Philip ran up to it. He heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? We need to question if they know and understand what the word of God says. Philip just so happened to encounter this Ethiopian eunuch. No, he didn't say this is an ordained this is an ordained plan by God for Philip to meet this man. It's an ordained. It's ordained for us to encounter some people sometimes. God has a purpose. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a purpose in his ministry. You do. You're not, he didn't save you and tell you to sit in the pew or in the chair or stay at home and not be a part of the work that he's doing. What a joy it is to be a part of what God is doing. It's a great joy. It's a great privilege. Yeah, it's a great responsibility. And it's scary at times. Oh, but man, is it a great joy. Do you not think I found joy up here this morning on this, on this thing right here, this seat? Huh? With all those little kids. Are, do you not think that was joy? If God hadn't called me to be who I am, I would not get to experience that joy every Sunday morning. I mean, I can't have a great joy. The Spirit of God told Philip to join that chariot. Notice what Philip did. I'll wait till it gets over here. No, he ran to it. Sometimes we just got to run when God tells us to run. When God tells us to go, we need to be, I mean, it's like a gunshot at a track meet. Bang! Gun goes off and the runners take off immediately. That's what we should be with God. Paul, go. Yes, sir, I'm going. Right then, don't wait, don't think about it. Because the more you think about it, the more you come up with what? Excuses. Excuses. Excuses are like ear holes. Everybody's got two of them. And then you have nose holes too. You got two of those too. And you can, now you got four excuses, right? Hmm? You need, the more you sit around, the more you think about it, right? The more you make more up, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. You know, it's a little cloudy today. I'll, st I'll stay in. You can think, you can, I'm telling you, you can think of some of the greatest excuses I've ever seen. You can do it. I know you can. You are ingenious people. We're all guilty, right? 
Aren't we all? Hmm. Philip asked the man, do you understand what you're reading? Notice what happens then. Verse 31, how can I? How can I understand what I'm reading unless someone guides me? Thirdly, we need to be prepared to point them to Jesus. In every spiritual interaction we have with any person, it should be our sole purpose to point that person to Jesus. You may be there to help fix their roof. You may be there to help fix their water leak or whatever it might be. In the midst of helping them, if we miss out on an opportunity to see where they are with Jesus, we've missed the whole purpose of our encounter with that person. We've missed it. Philip asked them, do you know what you're reading? Do you understand that? Now, have you ever been running and trying to listen to somebody talk at the same time? Philip, Philip, when he got close, when he's, I don't know how fast he had to run. I don't know how fast that chariot was going. You know, I, don't, I do not encourage you to try to run down a car today and try to, do you understand what you're, no, don't do that. They move too fast. But when you encounter people, ask them, do you understand what God's word says about love, about salvation, about eternal life? Ask them. You'd be amazed what kind of answers you might get. The man did not understand what he was reading and told Philip, how could he unless someone guides him? Guess what? That's you. That's me. That's us as believers. Here's the passage you read. You'll find this passage in Isaiah uh, chapter 53. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before its shearers, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The Philip asked, the, the eunuch said to Philip, I ask you, who is the prophet saying this about? Himself or someone else? The eunuch had no idea who the, Isaiah was talking about here. Well, we know. You do know, don't you? Well, if you've read the rest of the passage, you know. And I read it for you this morning. So now you know, right? But maybe you came this morning and not, did not know what Isaiah says here. Isaiah is speaking about Jesus hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus came. Isaiah saw a vision from God and God spoke to him and told him what his son would go through and how his son would deal with it. What his son would do? Jesus, as he's brought before the Sanhedrin, did not give up a defense, did not try to resist, did not try to stand against them. When they accused him of blasphemy and finally asked him, the high priest finally asked him, I adjure you by the living God, are you the Messiah? Jesus simply said, you said it. You said it. But there's coming a day, he said, when you will see the Son of Man at the right hand of the Father. And you, we saw that a few weeks ago when Stephen saw him up there. Huh? Amen? Stephen saw him up there. Isaiah sees Jesus like the sheep. John would later see Jesus as a sheep that had been slain, a lamb that had been slaughtered alive in heaven. I, I, I've, I've shared this numerous times and I really don't know but I think maybe the first time we see him we'll see him like that. I think when we see Jesus this is as John saw him that way in Revelation. I think when we see Jesus I think the scars will be evident for us to remind us of the price he paid for our souls. The price he paid for me and for you and for all of us who believe. A hefty price, his life. He died for you, he died for me, all of us. What an amazing gift. Maybe after we see him and after we worship him and after we're clothed in, in white robes or whatever the righteousness of Christ is on us, I don't know how it's all going to work. I'm going to wait until I get there and find out and, and I'll just get to experience it with you who believe. 
Maybe the scars will fade after them. After he, maybe after he wipes the tears from our eyes, then we won't see the scars no more. But Jesus paid a hefty price for us. And Philip takes the time in this passage to preach to this man, Jesus. When the eunuch asked him, how can I unless someone tells me? Philip said, I'll tell you who he's talking about. Let me tell you who he's talking about. And Philip, from that passage, preached to this man, Jesus. Preached to him, Jesus. We went through, a few years ago, here on Sunday nights, we went through every book of the Old Testament. We went through every book. We spent maybe one night or two nights on every book of the Old Testament finding Jesus in them. You'll find Jesus all over the Old Testament. Of course, you'll find him all over the Gospels, right? You'll find him all over the rest of the books of the New Testament too. But if you don't find him in your heart, you've not understood what you've read. Jesus must be found in your heart or else you'll never understand what you're reading. So, we go, the Spirit leads us. We ask them, do you know and do you understand what God's Word says? In that moment, we are always to be prepared to point them to Jesus. And then lastly, we send them on their way rejoicing. Folks, let me tell you. Now, I know a lot of you came for baptism this morning. I understand all that. See, your, your loved one to be baptized. I see. But when you leave this place, I want you to go home rejoicing. My sole purpose in preaching the gospel is to help people find him as their Savior and to send them on their way rejoicing. That's my sole purpose. I don't do it for any other reason than that. I want you to be filled with His Spirit. I want you to experience the joy of knowing Jesus, the joy of knowing that if you were, this is your last day on earth, you will be with him tomorrow. Or even today, if it's your last day, right? I don't think you have to go to some holding place. You immediately go to be with him. Man, that, that's a joy to me. It's a joy to me to know that beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I breathe my last breath today, that you'll find me in heaven. You'll find me with Jesus because of what he's done for me. I got rejoicing in my life. I want you to have that same rejoicing. The Ethiopian man, as they're traveling down the road, now this chariot's moving as they're talking. And here's another just so happened. Remember I told you, what was that? The desert road from Jerusalem to Gaza. It's not like driving from Morristown to Bean Station. We got lakes all over the place, right? You can stop anywhere else and, and throw your rod out if you're a fisherman or jump in if you're a, 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 a lake swimmer or whatever. There's lots of places you can put a boat in on the way down the road from Morristown to Bean Station, right? Plenty of them. This is the desert road. As they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. Just so happened there's some water in the desert. Huh? The eunuch said, look, there's water. What's keeping me from being baptized? Some translations, there's a section of Scripture that's added into this by some of the scribes that kind of would, in essence, make things easier to understand. And it said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. But that's only, I think, added to kind of clarify what the eunuch's asking and what Philip then says or does with him and baptizes him. The candidates today who are being baptized have made that proclamation. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Let me tell you something. I believe He is. I believe He's the Son of God. I believe He died for my sins. And I believe every one of you are a sinner, including me. 
We are all sinners. We have all come short of the glory of God. We've all come short of his expectations for our lives. But God still loved us. And according to Ephesians, and Paul's writing to the church of Ephesus there, even in our trespasses and sins, even in our lowest state, even in our ugliness, Christ loved us and still died for us. Ha! It's amazing, is it not? Normally the people who hurt us and do things against us, we don't have anything to do with them. But all of us were liars, cheats, murderers, adulterers, thieves, whatever you want to call us. We were all sinners. But Christ loved us and still died for us to wash away our sins. Look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? So he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, and he baptized him. The Ethiopian man believed what Philip preached that day. Not because Philip was some eloquent speaker. I believe he believed because God's Spirit was drawing him to faith. And you may be here today, and you, you've heard Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you've heard that you're a sinner, but Jesus still loved you even though you're a, a a wretched, ugly sinner. Say, that was me. <laughs> that was me. Okay? That was me. And he still loved me. And he still called me to salvation. And he gave me the faith to believe. And I accepted his offer. That night, when I was saved, I was spiritually baptized by the Holy Spirit. My sins were washed away. A few weeks, months later... I was baptized in the lake, dunked, symbolizing that I had chosen by the grace of God to follow Jesus Christ. And I've never stopped following. Have I been perfect? No. And I hate to break your heart. You're not perfect either. I don't care how great. Your, your mom's not perfect either, kids. Your dad's not I hate to break your heart. They're not perfect. You may think they are, but they burn the bread sometimes too. Huh? They'll overcook something. They'll get mad too. They'll get upset. They're not perfect. But the God we serve is. The God who loves us is. And the God who loves us is, I know you're not perfect, but I'm going to draw you to that perfect place someday. I'm going to make you perfect someday. I'm going to remove you from this place of sin someday, and I'll take sin away from you. That's what God does. You don't need to fix your life up and come to him. This Ethiopian eunuch, he couldn't do nothing to get God's grace. He couldn't do nothing to get Philip to tell him anything. He simply asked, how can I? Unless someone guides, I don't know what I'm reading. I don't understand this. How can I understand this? Philip says, I'll help you understand. And he preached to him, Jesus. And Jesus is the one who changed this man's life, not Philip. I've not changed anybody's life at all in this church. But Jesus has changed the multitude of people in this church. He has. It's Jesus. It's his word that changes people's lives. Philip baptized the man. Now, when they came up out of the water, man, if I could do this today, Man, I'll tell you what, if, I, if, if this happened to me today, what a glorious day it would be. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the unit did not see him any longer, but went on his way rejoicing. I, I can't explain that. I have no answer to that. Somehow or another, the Spirit of God physically moved Philip from this place to that. Man, sign me up. Let me experience that any day. Right? Let me experience that today, if that's your will, God. The, Philip, the Ethiopian unit, though, he no longer needed Philip. He no longer needed Philip because he had the Holy Spirit. Because when you get saved, when you trust Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit moves into your life to encourage you, to equip you, to strengthen you, to settle you in this life to walk alongside you every step of the way. The Ethiopian unit no longer needed Philip. He had God's Word, and he had the Holy Spirit now. I heard a story, and I, I know I've shared it numerous times. This man 
came up to the preacher after service one day and says, Preacher, I read God's Word, but I just don't understand what I'm reading. When the discussion carried on, went on for a little while actually, and went on for several weeks of talking, of counseling, of praying, the man finally accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Came back later, told the preacher, you know what? I can understand God's words now. I can read it and I can understand what I'm reading. What changed? What was different? The Holy Spirit was different. The Holy Spirit was in that man to help him understand what he was reading. So I ask you, when's the last time you read the Word of God? When's the last time you just stopped everything else, flipped open your Bible, and began to read? I ask you, when's the last time you've done it? And then I ask you, did you understand what you read? If you didn't, you need to call out to Jesus. If you're saved, ask Him to help you be guided by His Holy Spirit who's inside of you to help you understand that passage or passages you're reading. If you're lost today and want to understand the Word of God, ask Jesus Christ to save you, and He will, and He'll give you the gift of the Holy Spirit, and you'll be able to begin to understand the Word of God better and better and better. Guess what? I'm still learning this Word. I'll never stop learning this Word. I'll never get too big, too bold, too brave, too, too wise, too smart, too intelligent. Never will in this life because I still learn what God's Word has to say for me. Do you know Him today? If not, He knows you. He knows everything about you. He does. I don't know everything about you. You don't know everything about me. You don't want to know. And I don't want to know either. But He does. And, and according to Timothy's writings, or Paul's letter to Timothy, Paul told Timothy, God knows those who are His. He knows he knows if you belong to him or not. But he still loves you if you don't. And wants you to belong to him. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We praise you and thank you. If you were this morning, may you now take it and do what you want to with it. God, we've tried to be as clear. We've tried to be as, as, as upfront with what your word says. God, it was not just a chance meeting, a just so happened meeting that Philip encountered this Ethiopian eunuch, it was ordained by you. And God, I don't believe anybody here today is here by chance. They didn't just so happen to show up today. No, you drew them here for some purpose. And somebody, it may be, to hear your word preached today, to hear your word sung about today, to hear your love explained ex and exclaimed today. God, I pray if there's anybody, doesn't matter their age, little child, old adult. God, they're lost today. May you speak to them in this moment and may they ask you to save them. God, give them the faith to believe. Give them the faith to call out to you and ask you to save them today. God, we give you the praise and glory and thanksgiving in Christ's name. And amen. Let's stand.